Honey in the Rock. I want you to look at page 800 in your song book. I, I was looking for that song in our new song book, and then I ran across this, and I thought, I have never seen anything like this in all my life. Page 800 in your hymn book. Page 800. Now, I want you to look at the first stanza. Page 8. Maybe we can learn this one, uh, Ryan. I've seen it. Have you seen it before? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Look what it says. There was a Romish lady brought up in popery. Her mother always taught her the priest must, she must obey. Oh, pardon me, dear mother, I humbly pray thee now, for unto thee, false idols, I can no longer bow. Man, what a song. How about that? Y'all want to learn that? That'd be a good song. Amen. Huh? Blake and his wife's church. They do that one? Okay. All right. Maybe we can learn that. All right. Psalm 109, Psalm 109, hope you have your uh, outline. Psalm 109, actually we're going to take in just verse number one, but I want to read the first 13 verses. I got a reason for reading that, and I, <clears throat> this was not brought to my mind, and the, what I'm about to tell you is, was not brought to mind until I read these verses. And uh, in Psalm 109 it says, Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about with words of hatred, fought against me without a cause. For my love, they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And just a minute, you will see what he's praying. He says, and they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Now here's, here's David's prayer. He says, set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath, and let the stranger spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Now, what a prayer. What a prayer. But here's what I want you to realize this, that David is not praying for personal revenge. David is praying, David... Um, David was praying as God's king over his nation. And David wanted to see judgment upon the wicked because of the wicked's attack on the people of God. Now, when I read this, I was reminded, and if I would mention names, there's a couple of people in here that would remember this. But there was a pastor that could not get along with a deacon and this deacon was giving him all kinds of trouble, and he preached this right straight to that deacon. I mean, he's looking at that deacon and saying, let his children be fatherless, his wife a widow. I mean, he was just laying it on that guy. <laughs> and I thought, wow, what a misuse of scripture. <laughs> anyway, but David's praying his prayer. Now, when we go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us a little bit about how we ought to treat our enemies, how we ought to treat those that hate us and everything. And, uh, and, and, and where we have the law here, we have the fulfillment of the law in the New Testament. And Jesus talked about praying for your enemies, do good to them that hate you and despitefully use you and persecute you and so forth. But David here is praying not to get revenge, but praying as a king over his beloved nation and, and uh, over the uh, people of God. Now, turn to Psalm uh, 39, if you would. You don't have all of this in your outline, I, I don't think. Psalm 39, verse number, let's look at verse 1 through 4. Psalm 39, you may want to jot this down. I'll give you plenty of room on your outline to jot down some scripture. Psalm 39, 1 through 4. He says, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. 
I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days what it is that I may know how frail I am. Now, look at uh, verse number nine, same chapter. I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst it. Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. When thou, when thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity, Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. O oh, spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. And then in Psalm 83, Psalm 83, and we'll get to the message here in just a sec. Get to your outline here in just a second. Give you an idea of what we're going to do. Psalm 83. Psalm 83, verse number one. Keep not thou silence, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against the hidden ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may, no more, uh, may be no more in remembrance. They're still trying to do that, but they're, they're not going to succeed. Now, remember what Jesus said in John chapter number 15. He says, marvel not if the world hates you because it hated me before it hated you. Now, what you have heard in our reading is you heard the word silence a couple of different times. Now, that's what we're preaching on tonight or studying about. There are times when God seems to be silent. What are those times, preacher? Well, number one, look at your outline because sometimes God is silent because we aren't listening or we don't want to listen. So even though God may be speaking, you know what? The Bible says, he that hath ears to hear, let him what? Let him hear. Now, we all have ears, right? But sometimes we're not listening. I've been guilty of that. You've been guilty of that. We have been, we've all been guilty when somebody's speaking to us and we've got our mind somewhere else in outer space or something, you know. We're not paying much attention. Young, young people, as, as I can attest to this, being at one time young myself, when dad or grandpa would say something to me, I, I saw their lips move, but I just was not hearing anything that they were telling me. And so sometimes we're like that. And sometimes God seems to be silent, even though he's speaking to us, he seems to be silent because we aren't listening or we don't want to listen. Every time we travel, we'll, we'll stop and, and get a room somewhere. The very first thing after I get everything in the room, the very first thing I do is take that little sign that's hanging on the inside of your doorknob and I put it on the outside of the doorknob and it says, do not disturb. Now, sometimes we do God like that, don't we? God, I just don't want to hear what you're having to say. So sometimes we're not listening or we don't want to listen. Billy Sunday said that the reason a sinner can't find God is the same reason that a criminal can't find a policeman. It's because he just doesn't want to. Now, sin makes us turn a deaf ear to God. What did Adam and Eve do when, the, when they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. What did they do? What did they, do? they went and hid themselves, didn't they? Look at Psalm 28. <clears throat> Psalm 28, verse 1. Is that on your outline? I'm not sure. Okay. Psalm 28, verse number 1. I put these in here and uh, so we can all turn there and look at it. Psalm 28, 1. Verse number 1 says, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord my rock, be not silent to me, lest... If thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. And then we have a reference in Zechariah. If you turn to Malachi, the middle of your Bible, or the uh, end of the New Testament, go a couple of books backward, you find the book of Zechariah. And in chapter number 2, and verse number 13, 
<clears throat> the scripture says this, be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. So sin makes us turn a deaf ear to God. And by the way, we can't listen and talk at the same time, can we? How many of you ladies know that? How many of you ladies know that you can't listen and talk at the same time? How many of you guys know that? That you can't listen and talk at the same time? Look, especially <clears throat> your wife is trying to tell you something and you're listening, but at the same time you're trying to talk over her. So you can't listen and talk at the same time. I, I get accused all the time, this is probably true, that when the kids or somebody's trying to explain something to me, I won't let them finish their sentence. I just go right into telling them what I think they need to do. Guys, are y'all like that too? I think all these guys are. I saw Sue pointing to Harvey there, just <laughs> out of the corner of my eye. So. Now look, sometimes God, <laughs> Sometimes God seems silent because we aren't listening or we don't want to listen. Now, I know this. I know this from observation. And here, I'm going to say it, okay? Y'all want me to say it, right? I'm going to say it. I've seen people while I'm preaching or while other people are preaching or conducting the, sound, or conducting the song service, <clears throat> I've seen people on their gadget and gadget and all that stuff, whatever they're texting or, or whatever they're doing. They sure ain't worshiping God and they're sure not talking to God. You don't talk to God through that, right? You talk to him through prayer. But I see it. I see it. And I'm thinking, you know what? I don't even know why you're here. Why don't you stay home and do that stuff? Because you're sure not getting anything out of the house of God and the word of God and the fellowship of God. I think it's a shame when we got when we brought social media into the churches in, in this respect, I'm, I'm, now look, I'm glad we broadcast the messages. I'm glad we get the word of God out like that. But I'm telling you, there's so much distraction in the head up here. And, 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 and God, look, the devil is the prince of the power of the air. And those messages go out through the air. And I'm just telling you what, worship is not like it used to be or is not like it should be. We're too busy. We're too busy. You can say amen there if you want. That's okay. Well, sometimes we're not listening because we aren't ready for the message. Not ready for the message. Sometimes we have to go through what we call refining trials before we get ready to listen or before we are ready to listen. Have you ever said this <clears throat> when something's happening in your life? Have you ever said this? And I hope you have. Have you ever said, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? Huh? What are you trying to tell me? Sometimes God seems silenced because we aren't ready for the message. Sometimes silence is an attention getter. Now, in John chapter 16, you have the reference there. I think you do, don't you? In John chapter 16, look at verse, look what he tells his disciples in John chapter number 16. In verse number 12, John 16 and 12. He says here, I, Jesus said, I have yet... I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you unto all, or into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you, all, or he will shew you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall shew it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall shew it unto you. Now, none of us, none of us are ready for bad news. We're not ready for bad news. Even though, <clears throat> listen, even though we know that bad news could happen in a matter of time, in a matter of days, maybe in a matter, especially when there's one sick terminal uh, with some kind of sickness and the doctor says something like this, he's got a week or She's got a day or two. Or, I mean, we're not, even though we know that it's going to happen, we're not ready for it. We're not ready for bad news. 
But along, listen, along with the good news of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, there must be bad news of eternal punishment in a place called hell. There has to be both of them. We're not ready for the bad news. We like good news all the time, but I'm telling you, uh, the message of the gospel is not just good news, and, and that is good news that people can trust Jesus and get saved, but the bad news is if you don't get saved, if you don't receive Christ, you'll burn, into the, you'll burn in the lake of fire. Now that's bad news and we're not ready for that, but most people don't wanna, I don't wanna hear the bad news, give me the good news. I don't wanna hear the bad news. But listen, always the gospel carries with it the negative side too. I heard people say, I just don't like that negative stuff. Well, your car won't run on two positive sides of the battery. There is no such thing. You gotta have a positive side and a negative side. You gotta have a hot and a neutral in, electric, in electricity and ground, of course. But I'm just telling you that sometimes we're not, sometimes God doesn't speak because we're not ready for the message. Then there's a lack of maturity. There's a lack of maturity. You know, a child is not ready for a grown up message. You ever, you ever be discussing something with your wife or uh, parents discussing something or grandparents and you have a little kid that comes up and just looking and they're just staring at you. What are y'all talking about? And you say something like this, you wouldn't understand. And, and it's like that. Listen, sometimes children are not ready for, a, for an adult message. And so you don't give them an adult message. You say, well, where's that in the Bible? Well, Paul speaks to the church at Corinth. In chapter three of 1 Corinthians, he says, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He said, I can't, I can't give you the mature stuff. I have to feed you with milk again. You're not able to bear it. So sometimes God is silent because we're not mature enough for the message. Think about that. Think about that for just a minute. Lack of maturity. And then sometimes God is silent because we're not willing to obey anyway. God's, God's always ready. God's always ready to show us his will, but he shows his will only to those who really want to do it. Look at John, we're in John, I think, already. Look at John, seven, John chapter number seven. John chapter number seven and verse number 17. And we caught a little bit of this in John, in John chapter 16, I think it was. But in John 7, look at verse number 17. Jesus, verse 16, Jesus answered him and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. Now that seems to be backwards. I like to know something before I do it. I, I like to know what's involved before I take it on. But that's not the way Jesus works. He says, if you'll do it, then I'll show you. Right? <laughs> he says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So God's ready to show us if we really want to do it. But if we don't want to do it, God's not going to show us. God, you know what? God was silent to Abraham, wasn't he? 13 years. Famine hit the land. You know what Abraham did? He said, oh, you know, Abraham was mentioned in, in, about being a man of faith over in Hebrews 11. But you know what? When Abraham got in trouble, he went down to Egypt to get some help. Egypt always type of the world, of course. But Abraham, the whole time, man, what a mess. Man, when he went down to Egypt, <laughs> he got caught up in all kinds of messes. Had to lie about his wife. Oh, he picked up, he picked up, uh, well, he got some riches and gathered some things together and all that. But I'm telling you what, he was in a mess the whole time he was in Egypt. And listen, you check it out, not one time did God speak to Abraham the whole time he was in Egypt. 
Not one time. He should have stayed in the land where God put him. Even though famine was in the land, God can take care of the man in a famine, can he? Well, then Jesus was silent to Herod. You remember that? Who was Herod? He was the one that, uh, he was wanting to see Jesus do some miracles and things like that. In fact, let's go there in Luke 23. You're in John 7. Back up a few pages, you'll run into Luke 23. And look at verse number 9, Luke 23, 9. Herod saw Jesus in verse 8. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season. Now, I wonder why he wanted to see Jesus. Well, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him in many words, but he answered him nothing. But he answered him nothing. Why does God seem to be silent? Because he knows that we aren't ready to obey. Then lastly, why does God seem to be silent? Because he wants to teach us the importance of silence. Sometimes it's not what God says, it's what God doesn't say. Sometimes it's, what, it's not what God does, it's what he doesn't do. And I'm telling you, one of the important things about God being silent is this thing that we all have trouble with, that's waiting, waiting upon the Lord. Waiting helps us, to remind, helps us to remind us that God is still on the throne and that God is in control. Amen. Psalm 50, I got that last verse that we'll look at tonight. Psalm 50, why does God seem to be silent? Psalm 50, verse 1. Psalm 51. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come, you see that, and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him, he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself, Selah. There's going to come a time when God breaks his silence. And he's going to let this whole world know who, who's in charge. He's going to take us out of this world. Tribulation will come upon this old world. God's going to have the last say, the last word, the last laugh. And all this world's going to know that he is God. In the beginning was the what? Word, word and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, I'm going to tell you what this world right now would like to silence our voice. They would like to silence the voice of God. They would like to silence every gospel preacher that's ever walked the face of this earth. And one day they may, look, look, they may shut our mouths, they may put us in prison, but I'm going to tell you, the word is going to prevail one day. Amen. Amen. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the lesson on silence when you seem to be silent. Father, there's some great lessons that you teach us. Father, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know Christ, that certainly you have not been silent to their heart, but you have brought maybe conviction to their life, their heart, that they need Christ tonight. Pray that you would let that be so. Whether it's anybody in this auditorium or maybe somebody watching, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll just have your will and way. Keep not silence, Lord. Speak to hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's